All right, this time's uh, all about evolutionary trends. And these trends are along evolution, along the phylogenetic tree of the animal kingdom. So we're going to be making comparisons, uh, a system-by-system -system comparison between what I'm going to refer to as lower, the lower invertebrates versus the me medium invertebrates and the higher invertebrates along the phylogenetic tree. And just like the whole organism evolves and species evolve uh, along the line of, lines of uh, the phylogenetic tree, systems are evolving too. And systems are evolving to uh, become more complex and be able to perform more functions or perform more efficiently uh, as animals themselves become more complex and larger and more active. Now, I know there's a lot on this slide because I, I've been adding to it little by little, um, but we're going to concentrate on what's listed at the bottom. And we'll start with what's listed at the bottom and kind of end with what's listed at the bottom. Um, so the, the first trend that we're looking at here is the trend from intracellular digestion to extracellular digestion. And, you know, if you'll recall, animal the animal kingdom has common ancestry with the kingdom protista, the uh, animal like protus, the protozoa. And protozoa capture food and engulf it by phagocytosis, and then they digest that food inside their cells because they're single-celled organisms, right? Single-celled or colonial organisms. So they're digesting their food. They're taking in very small food particles and digesting them inside the cells. And that's what we're calling intracellular digestion. When it comes to a true animal, like a sponge, uh, or a cnidarian, um, sponges being almost the same, you know, almost just a little bit more than a, a colony are still using intracellular digestion. So that's what I'm pointing out up here. So we're not seeing an image of a peripherin on the slide here. We're not seeing an image of a sponge, but their cells are still taking in food particles and digesting those food particles inside the cells. So they're, they're still using intracellular digestion what you could consider to be a protozoan-like um, way of, of eating. Whereas in cnidarians, there's more of a combination. They have this gastrovascular cavity where they, do, where they carry out their digestion. So they'll take food in through their mouth and they'll digest it in their gastrovascular cavity. And notice the name of that cavity, gastrovascular. So it's a, a, co a combination word, a compound word. Gastro referring to stomach, vascular referring to circulation. So this is a, a feature of their body that carries out two functions. It not only digests their food, but it also circulates the nutrients from that food throughout the inside of their body. And I drew these red lines out into the tentacles to show that the gastrovascular cavity actually extends out into the tentacles. So you can think of the tentacles as being hollow, but they're not empty. They're full of fluid, um, the fluid of the gastrovascular cavity. So in that way, nutrients and oxygen, carbon dioxide, whether, whatever's going to be transported around inside the animal is transported in that aqueous solution, in that fluid that is inside the gastrovascular cavity and extends throughout the inside of the animal. But their digestion is part, partly extracellular. So the food begins digesting inside the gastrovascular cavity, outside the cells that are lining the cavity. But then as the food breaks up into small particles, then some of the cells along that's, some of the cells that are lining the gastrovascular cavity take in those food particles and digest them inside the cells. So in, in cnidarians, there's a combination going on of extracellular and intracellular digestion. Platyhelminthes likewise has a gastrovascular cavity, um, and but they're carrying out more extracellular digestion. So as we go along in evolution, we see this trend away from intracellular digestion to extracellular digestion, and everything from Platyhelminthes on up in the phylogen in the phylogeny of the animal kingdom uses extracellular digestion for the most part. The next evolutionary trend we're looking at is two -way, a two-way gastrovascular cavity to a one-way alimentary canal. So you'll note that both cnidarians and tenophorans, I've been kind of ignoring them, but I'm listing the phyla that have these same characteristics here. So both cnidarians and tenophorans, the comb jellies, have this kind of uh, arrangement 
for their digestive system, a gastrovascular cavity, along with the flatworms, except it's highly branched, so that's an evolutionary step to increase surface area, of course. It's highly branched to in both increase surface area and to deliver the nutrients throughout the inside of the body of the animal. Um, but notice that both of these are designated, or, or this system that uses a gastrovascular cavity, there's only one opening. There's one mouth slash anus. Same here, mouth slash anus. Um, so that's a two-way digestive system. The, the food goes in the mouth. What can't be digested has to come back out of the mouth because, you know, not, not everything in food can be digested necessarily. And, and so waste has to come back out. And that's the function of the mouth in these organisms that have only one opening. If you'll recall on the phylogenetic tree, we go from uh, platyhelminthes, the flatworms, to nematoda, which are the round worms. And, uh, but what we're looking at here is an annelid, so that's, that's a little bit further along. But nematoda is where an alimentary canal started out. In other words, nematoda was the first phylum, or common ancestors of nematodes, were the first to have both a mouth at one end and an anus at the other. And that's what we're calling an alimentary canal or a digestive tract, T-R-A-C-T. So that's the significance of, of first being in parentheses here beside, behind nematoda. Nematodes were the first, um, and then it carried on in evolution. And everything from nematodes on has an al alimentary canal, has a mouth at one end, and a digestive tract, and then the anus at the other end. The next evolutionary trend is from a uniform canal, and I have nematoda in parentheses here because that's what we see in nematodes, um, in roundworms. They're, you know, they're the intestine that runs, or the, uh, the uh, alimentary canal, that, or the digestive tract that runs from the mouth to the anus is basically just one uniform tube, a straight uniform tube. There's no real specialization as you go along that tube. It's just uh, one long intestine, and it all pretty much looks the same. And uh, as the food passes through that intestine, the nutrients are absorbed. But we see in evolution um, a, a trend towards specialized regions, <clears throat> different parts of the digestive tract doing different things. And that's what's being represented here in phylum Analyta. So we've got the mouth and then the pharynx, um, which sucks in food. Uh, that's its main function. And then it passes down an, what could be considered an esophagus to a crop, which is a holding chamber, and then a gizzard, which is a grinding chamber, and then into the intestine, which is for absorption of the nutrients, and then out the anus. So there are specialized regions, and we see that continue evolutionarily. I mean, think of your own digestive system. We see that kind of evolution continue, and not only are there specialized regions along the alimentary canal, we eventually, we eventually see the evolution of accessory organs, organs that are outside the digestive tract that are secreting things into the digestive tract and, and helping in the digestion and absorption of nutrients. And that's being represented here by phylum arthropoda. So the, uh, digestive glands that are hanging out outside of the stomach here would be representative of accessory organs. Um, for you, accessory organs would include your liver and your gallbladder and your pancreas. So those are the evolutionary trends that we see in the digestive systems in the animal kingdom. So now we're looking at the respiratory system. And uh, the respiratory system is complicated by the evolutionary step from uh, water to land, from an uh, aquatic environment to a terrestrial environment. So it involves the evolution of uh, gills to lungs, but it starts with diffusion only. So again, here here's the evolutionary trend for the most part down at the bottom. Diffusion only to gills to trachea and lungs to increase surface area is the trend in uh, respiratory system evolution. And if you're relatively small and simple, and I'm using air quotes again that you can't see, uh, simple organism living in an aquatic environment, you're surrounded by water, you're full of water, and you can exchange gases. And that's what, ga that's what uh, the respiratory system does. It's involved in gas exchange, gas exchange between the surrounding environment and the tissues of the animal. 
And so if you're a relatively small animal and completely surrounded and filled with water, you can just exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide between the cells of your body and the water itself, whether it be on the water surrounding you or the water inside you. And so all these phyla get by basically just doing that, just using simple diffusion. So periphera, cnidaria, platyomythes, nematoda, rotifera, tardigrada, echinodermata are all simply diffusing oxygen in and carbon dioxide out, uh, exchanging that with the surrounding water, not using any kind of specialized organs like, like gills. The next step is the evolution of organs that are specialized just for respiration, just, uh, just for gas exchange, and, and that would be represented by what we call gills. Uh, and a gill is a gill because it's exchanging gas between water and blood. Um, and so that's what we're seeing here. And we see, we see it first appear evolutionarily in the mollusks. So this is like a clam, a shadowy uh, image of a clam, but it's, it's highlighting the gill um, that you'll find, the gills that you'll find inside a clam, and how the water is circulating over the gills to exchange, you know, to, to allow the clam to be able to absorb oxygen and give off carbon dioxide. So the water comes in, bringing oxygen with it. The gills extract that oxygen, and, and that oxygen then goes into the blood, the fluids uh, inside the animal, and it gets circulated around, distributed to cells. The water th then uh, continues to pass over the gills, and ca carbon dioxide can be released or diffused into that water, and then it goes right back out of the clam again. Because we're talking about gills here, I wanted to introduce this concept known as countercurrent exchange. And what we're looking at here is really more, a lot more of a fish gill. And the idea is that the water is passing over the gill in one direction, and the blood flows through the filaments of the gill in the opposite direction. And that countercurrent exchange, the fact that the water is going one direction and the blood's going the opposite direction, increases the ability of, of diffusion between the blood or exchange of gases between the blood and the water. Um, so that's what that's all about. Countercurrent exchange is a way of increasing the efficiency of the gill, the gas exchange taking place in the gill. And that's necessary in water because water doesn't have that much oxygen in it compared to air. So what animals have gills? Well, mollusks were uh, one of the first evolutionarily in annelids. Uh, certain annelids have gills. Earthworms don't have gills, which are annelids, um, but that's because they're terrestrial annelids. So we're talking primarily the aquatic annelids. Same with arthropods. Aquatic arthropods will have gills. Um, but again, we call a gill a gill mainly because of, uh, or based on what it's exchanging gas between. If it's exchanging gas between, or getting gas from, uh, water, oxygen from water and giving off carbon dioxide into the water, that's why we call it a gill, because it's happening with water. If the exchange is happening with the air, then we call it a lung. But arthropods are weird in that they have developed a, uh, a separate system or a specialized system for exchanging gas that does not qualify as a lung um, and it's known as a tracheal system and trachea you have a trachea too it's the tube that carries the air from your mouth and nose down to your lungs right so trachea simply refers to a tube that carries air and that's what we see in arthropods there's a system of tubes that runs throughout the inside of their body and delivers air directly to the cells of their body. So they're not exchanging gas between uh, with the air and, and putting like oxygen into their blood and then circulating their blood around. They're delivering the gas through these tubes directly to the cells of their body and that and the oxygen's then diffusing directly into the cells and carbon dioxide is diffusing directly out of their cells. So they basically just filled themselves up with air. Um, and there are openings along their sides called spiracles, and that's where the air goes in and out. Um, and as you know, um, they're Madagascar hissing cockroaches, and we have some in our classroom. Um, and when they hiss, the way they hiss is to force the air out of their tracheal system and through their spiracles, uh, and that's what produces the hiss. So again, aquatic arthropods can have gills, whereas terrestrial arthropods, including spiders, so insects and spiders, which is a, a huge number of species, um, are using this tracheal system to exchange gas. And then we see the evolution of lungs. Um, but again, lungs are, are referred to as lungs because they're exchanging gas with air. And so, for example, mollusks, snails that live on land, ha technically have lungs because they have... Uh, they're exchanging gas with the air, but their lung looks just like 
the gill of their aquatic counterparts. So uh, an aquatic snail and a terrestrial snail are both using the same structure to exchange gas, but in the aquatic snail we would call it a uh, gill, and in the, in the terrestrial snail we would call it a lung. Um, and lungs started out just basically just smooth sacs um, that were thin and moist and vascularized. These are the three characteristics that uh, allow for gas exchange between air and uh, cells of a tissue. Um, so that tissue needs to be thin and it needs to be moist because the uh, oxygen actually diffuses into water first and then diffuses into the cells. Um, and then, and highly vascularized so that uh, the oxygen can then go into the blood and be circulated around throughout the entire animal. Um, so that's what we see in the evolution of lungs. Um, we see that the uh, lungs get more convoluted, um, more surface area, not just a smooth sac, but indentations in that sac uh, to, uh, or undulations to increase the surface area folding to increase the surface area for gas exchange. Um, and, and so that's the final uh, evolutionary trend is towards an increase in surface area. And when it comes to uh, the uh, ultimate of that, we see in our own lungs these little sacs, these little um, bags at the very, very ends, at the very, very tips of our bronchioles that, are, that carry air into our lungs, there are these little chambers called alveoli, and uh, alveoli or alveolus refers to grapes. So it kind of looks like a bunch of grapes, and that's why they call these uh, alveoli. Um, but what they do is they increase surface area. They increase the surface area for gas exchange in our lungs, so it greatly increases the, uh, the surface area, and that's what allows us to get the amount of oxygen that we need and get rid of the carbon dioxide that we want to get rid of. So again, the trend in respiratory systems is from simple diffusion, which is used by most small aquatic animals, invertebrate animals, to gills, um, exchange with water, to trachea and lungs for exchange with air, and then increased surface area to increase the efficiency of the gas exchange with air. Here we're comparing circulatory systems, and uh, circulatory systems are all about transport, transporting gases and nutrients around inside the animal. So we see a, the evolutionary trend here from simple diffusion, you know, just like in the respiratory system. If you're an aquatic, uh, small aquatic invertebrate, you're surrounded by water and filled with water, and, and simple diffusion is good enough for uh, transporting things around inside uh, your body. But we see this, uh, the trend towards op what we call open circulation, and then finally closed circulation, and the difference between the two are illustrated by the species that we're looking at here and comparing. And actually, let's start with closed circulation because open circulation is kind of defined by what it does not have. And in closed circulation, closed circulation is more efficient because the blood is always contained within a vessel. So that's what you want to remember as a definition for a closed, a closed circulatory system. And this diagram shows it here. There's going to be a heart or a heart-like structure that's pumping the blood through the system. But the blood um, then branches out and branches out into smaller and smaller vessels, but it's always within some kind of vessel, no matter how small the vessels get. And those are, would, would be what we would call capillaries. Um, but the blood is always contained within a vessel, a blood vessel. And we see that in phylum Analyta here and, and uh, all, all phyla from there on up for the most part. In open circulation, the blood is not always contained within a vessel. So again, if we start with the diagram, the heart pumps the blood into vessels, but then the blood is released from the vessels in just into spaces between tissues. And we call those, uh, we call those spaces sinuses. Um, you know, just like the sinuses that are in your skull, uh, that if you have sinus infections and so forth, they give you trouble. Um, but anyway, the blood is released into these spaces within tissues in between cells. Um, we also refer to that as interstitial space between cells. But then it's eventually picked back up again by blood vessels and, and brought back to the heart to be pumped out again. But it, it's not always contained within a vessel. And that's what we see in the phylum Arthropoda. And most mollusks, not all mollusks, class Cephalopoda is the exception. And cephalopods are squid and octopi. Uh, and so forth, uh, cuttlefish, also open circulation in tardigrades, 
Um, but then, you know, all the other lower phyla, quote unquote, are using simple diffusion. Um, so by the time we get to the annelids, uh, well, phyla mollusca cephalopoda, I suppose, would be first, um, along with phylum annelida. They have closed circulation, um, which is more efficient. And we see that carry on to uh, the phylum echinodermata and chordata, which includes ourselves, because we have closed circula circulation also. And you might think to yourself, well, why do these species have open circulation if it's not very efficient? Well, again, in evolution, whatever works stays. And because it works, they don't need anything more efficient. Um, as long as it works, it's not going to go away or be selected against by natural selection. So because it works, it, it stays. And one last point, um, annelids not only have closed circulation, they also were the first to evolve hemoglobin in their blood. Um, and both of those were probably responses to uh, living in very low oxygen environments. So they needed a closed circulatory system to transport oxygen more efficiently around inside the body. And they also evolved hemoglobin to be able to pick up that oxygen and carry it around in their blood. And to emphasize that point, I went ahead and added hemoglobin here to uh, the end of the evolutionary trend. Next, we move on to the excretory system. For the excretory system, we first need to define what it is. Um, and in you, your excretory system is carried out by your kidneys. Uh, it's the production of urine to get rid of nitrogenous waste, as we call it, which is a waste product of the, uh, that results from the digestion of proteins. Um, and also osmoregulation, if you'll recall, uh, that's the water balance inside your body and the water balance between the uh, cytoplasm of your cells compared to the surrounding solution. Uh, if you'll recall, that needs to be what we call isotonic. The uh, uh, amount of dissolved substances or particles inside the cells has to equal the dissolved particles outside the cells. The concentrations have to be uh, <clears throat> um, isotonic so that your cells don't either shrink and sh or shrivel. Remember, we call that cytolysis. Oh, I'm sorry, we call that uh, crenation in, in animals anyway. Um, and your cells also don't want to take on water and blow up and possibly explode. That That's called cytolysis. Um, so if you'll recall all of that back when we were studying uh, aqueous solution chemistry and diffusion and osmosis, that's what that has to do with. So you're your excretory system is responsible for those two things, osmoregulation and getting rid of nitrogenous waste along with other waste products from uh, that are filtered out of your blood. And like other evolutionary trends, we see that it starts with diffusion only. But then it goes to uh, well, what I'm calling here interstitial tubules. And again, interstitial refers to spaces between cells. And you'll notice that any of, any of these excretory systems or all of these excretory systems that we're looking at here involve tubules. So tubules are a common theme in excretory systems. And what's going on is that those tubules, like for example in the flatworm here, these interstitial tubules are running throughout the inside of the animal and they are uh, picking up nitrogenous waste and excess water and getting rid of that through pores uh, that lead to outside of the body. And we're zooming in on a part of the tubules here uh, that make up the system in the flatworm. And we see these specialized cells called flame cells that are, uh, they have cilia. And that when the cilia beats, it moves the fluid through the tubules. Um, so that's what circulates the fluid. These flame cells, their function is to circulate the fluid within the tubules, the interstitial tubules within the flatworm. Um, but that's the system in flatworms and in roundworms, nematodes. Um, but then we see the evolution of nephridia, which are tubules, um, like in this annelid here, there is a, there are, there's a pair of nephridia in every segment all the way along the worm. If you'll recall, annelids are segmented worms. And that's one of the things that uh, is repeated in the segments of a segmented worm of an annelid are nephridia. There's one on one side and there's one on the other side. And in this diagram, we're only seeing one side of the worm. But there's a pair of nephridia in every segment all the way along the worm. Um, and I'm, I'm referring it to, I'm referring to it here as a primitive nephron because nephrons are what you have in your kidneys. And nephrons look very much like nephridia. 
they're just a, a, a convoluted tubule, um, and that tubule special, is specialized to remove waste and remove water from the body or excess water if need be, um, and get rid of it. So uh, in you, again, you have your kidneys, and your kidneys have millions of nephrons, and each nephron is carrying out the function of removing wastes and, uh, and, and holding on to good things. Um, so, you know, the, the kidney kind of has to decide or the nephron, not decide, so to speak, but has to differentiate between what is waste and what is supposed to be kept. And so that's what your kidneys are doing. It's getting rid of, of bad things and it's keeping good things, um, including water. So I just added kidney here because the evolution of the, ki of the kidney and the nephron uh, go together. Um, kidneys are made up of nephrons. Uh, the other thing to point out here is that when it comes to nephridia, the nephridia are removing the nitrogenous waste and, and uh, water from the salomic fluid. So this, the inside of this worm is filled with fluid, and that fluid is within the second cavity other than the digestive cavity, that cavity we call a coelom. And so we call the fluid that fills the worm, the, the fluid that fills the coelom, coelomic fluid. And that's what the uh, the waste products are being removed from when it comes to animals that have nephridia, annelida and mollusca. Um, the kidneys, on the other hand, are removing those waste products uh, from the blood. All right, so there's, that, there's a distinction there between the fluids that uh, the wastes are being removed from. And just like we see uh, in the respiratory systems, arthropods have a different respiratory system. They also have a different kind of uh, excretory system known as malpigian tubules. That's how you pronounce that, malpigian. Uh, and so these, these are tubules, you know, like, like all uh, of these excretory systems are made up of tubules, but these are specialized tubules that are hanging off of the hindgut, hanging off of the alimentary canal, the uh, digestive tract. And they're removing wastes and excess water from the salomic fluid. So again, the uh, grasshopper that we're looking at here, it has a coelom, and that coelom is full of fluid, and the malpigian tubules are hanging out in that fluid and removing nitrogenous wastes and other waste products uh, from that fluid along with excess water and putting that into the digestive tract. Um, but not so much excess water, and the reason, the reason that... Uh, arthropods, uh, terrestrial arthropods have this system, and it's, so it's not only uh, grasshoppers and insects, it's also um, spiders, for example. Um, this is to conserve water. It actually conserves water, because if you're an insect, if you're a small animal like this, you have a hard time holding on to the water uh, that's in your body. So malpigian tubules allow for these animals to get rid of their nitrogenous wastes not using a whole lot of water. And because I haven't mentioned it yet, um, this label urea is here uh, because that's the form of nitrogenous waste that you pee out. Again, the excretory system is producing urine and you, you, and the reason we call urine urine is because you're getting rid of nitrogenous waste in the form of urea. And one additional note, and I didn't want to add it on here because this, this slide's full enough, but we go, uh, there's a trend here to go from removing nitrogenous wastes from the interstitial fluid to the coelom to the blood. So interstitial coelom blood is also a uh, evolutionary trend that we see in excretory systems. And finally, we're comparing the nervous system. And uh, if we start with periphera, and remember, periphera is hardly more than a colony of cells, no true tissues, and no nervous system whatsoever. That doesn't mean there's no communication between cells at all, but there is nothing that can be identified as a nervous system in sponges, in peripherans. Cnidarians and tenophorans are the first to show uh, some kind of nervous system, but what they have is what you could consider a diffuse uh, system of neurons throughout the uh, throughout their body, uh, very evenly distributed throughout their body. So there's no concentration of nervous tissue in any one place, and the, and so we can't consider them to have any kind of brain. Um, that that's really what a brain is: is a concentration of nervous tissue in one place, uh, like a central processing center. And we don't see that at, at all in these uh, lower quote unquote invertebrates. 
So basically what they have is nothing but a peripheral nervous system, PNS standing for peripheral nervous system. Um, no central nervous system, CNS for central nervous system. A central nervous system is a brain and cord. Um, so like in this flatworm, uh, platyhelminthes, we see that they have these things that are labeled ganglia. And, and again, again, well, not again, but um, like I said, a brain is a concentration of nervous tissue, and that's what a ganglia is. But in the case of this flatworm, um, we can consider these two ganglia in the head to be a primitive brain. Um, so then we see these two cords coming from the brain, uh, and they're running along the sides of the animal, and so lateral refers to sides. So these are lateral nerve cords, and they have a ladder-like uh, nervous system. Their nervous system is arranged kind of like a ladder with the nerve cords along the sides, the lateral nerve cords, and then there are nerve cords that are connecting them that are kind of like the rungs of the ladder. And if you look all along the sides of those lateral nerve cords, you'll see smaller nerves that are coming out uh, and, and going to the periphery of the animal, to the outer edges of the animal. That's what we refer to as the periphery, away from the midline. So anything away from the midline is the periphery of an animal. Um, those are positional terms that we use. And uh, so these flatworms, they have both a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. So we go from a central nervous system made up of a brain and lateral nerve cords to a central nervous system that has a brain and a ventral nerve cord. And we see that represented here in this grasshopper. So both the central nervous system, the brain and ventral nerve cord, but you'll notice that there are ganglia, concentrations of nervous tissue along the nerve cord, along with uh, nerves that are reaching out into the periphery of the animal. And so that's the peripheral nervous system. So both the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. And we see the same kind of arrangement in the phylum nematoda and tardigrada and analyta. And if you'll recall, ventral refers to along the belly, basically. So their nerve cord is running along the underside of the animal, along the belly of the animal. From the ventral nerve cord, we see the trend towards a dorsal nerve cord. So in other words, the uh, nerve cord from the, from the brain, the part of the central nervous system along with the brain, is running along the back of the animal. And that's our arrangement. Phylum chordata in general, the nerve cord runs along the back. Now, we're seeing a strange exception to the arrangement of the central nervous system when we're looking at cephalopods. Remember, cephalopods are a class within the phylum mollusca. So this is phylum mollusca class cephalopoda, octopi and squid. Because their body plan is so different and they have all these arms that they have to control, their, um, their nervous system is somewhat radial, uh, meaning organized in a circle. Um, so they have this radial nerve, for example, along with multiple brains. You may have heard that uh, octopi and, and squid are able to actually control each arm. There's almost like a separate brain for each arm, and they can they can act kind of independently of one another. Um, so they have a relatively a very complex nervous system, and, and you may have also heard that they're very smart. Um, but it's a, a different arrangement because of the arrangement of their, their body. And it's the same with echinoderms. Echinoderms, if you'll recall, are pentaradially symmetrical. So their nervous system is also in a circular arrangement, a radial arrangement. But in general, the idea here is that cnidarians and, and teneforans have only a peripheral nervous system, only this network that's kind of evenly spread throughout their body, no brain, no cords. And then in, in flatworms, we see the evolution of a brain, of brain uh, and cords. And that goes from lateral nerve cords then to a ventral nerve cord and from ventral nerve cords to dorsal nerve cords. So that's kind of the, the general uh, evolution of the arrangement of the nervous systems in Kingdom Animalia. Oh, and I probably should have started up here um, in, in introducing the slide. Uh, what I have here is a term, it's a combination term, compound word, sensoromotor. That's basically what your nervous system does. It senses things from the surrounding environment, and it controls your movements, right? So sensoromotor, uh, and that's what produces your behavior. So the behavior that we see in animals is all the result of the nervous system, the action of the nervous system. Finally, we're taking a look at the musculoskeletal system, 
uh, in other words, the system that's responsible for support and movement. Um, and the, the first point that I wanted to make here is what's right, right underneath the title. Muscles require something to contract against. So even if something doesn't have a skeleton in the sense that you're used to, either an endoskeleton like you have or an exoskeleton like arthropods have, there's, uh, the, the muscles still have to con contract against something. And uh, that's what we call, uh, well, in, in the simpler animals, that's what we call a hydrostatic skeleton. So even though they might not have an exoskeleton or an endoskeleton hard parts, they might be a soft-bodied animal like this, this hydra that we're looking at here as an example. Um, it doesn't have either kind of hard skeleton, but it does have this fluid-filled cavity. And the fluid in that cavity is under pressure. And the pressure of that fluid is what supports the animal. That's what we call a hydrostatic skeleton, and it does give the muscles something to contract against to move the animal. If we go even lower than that, peripherins, being the simplest kind of animals, no true tissues, they don't have any kind of uh, muscles, um, muscle tissue or muscles, so they don't move. Uh, they do have a, some, some supportive structures, though, that are known as spicules. And when we study sponges, the phylum periphery, you'll, you'll find out about spicules. But these spicules are, are just like little um, pieces of calcium carbonate or silica that kind of interlock together and help to support the animal. So they do have a skeletal system of sorts, but no, no mus muscular system. Whereas the hydra uh, doesn't have any kind of hard parts, but again, it does have the gastrovascular cavity, and it not only carries out that function of digestion and circulation, but also support in that it acts as a hydrostatic skeleton. Then eventually we see the evolution of uh, exoskeletons and endoskeletons, and, and arthropods are the first to have an exoskeleton, and echinoderms are the first to have any kind of endoskeleton. Um, and this is similar to our endoskeleton, and this shows some common ancestry between the phylum Echinodermata and Chordata. If you'll recall, on the phylogenetic tree, uh, the phylum Chordata, which includes us and our endoskeleton, is very close to the branch for Echinodermata at the very end there. Um, so that that's this is one of the pieces of evidence that uh, supports the common ancestry of, of Echinoderms and Chordates. And their endoskeletons made up of bony plates that are embedded in their skin. And believe it or not, our skeleton uh, also originates from the uh, the ectoderm, uh, the skin, basically. So the development of our skeletons and echinoderm skeletons, the embryonic development, uh, is pretty much the same. But again, echinoderms are weird in a lot of different ways. And, and so in addition to their... Uh, skeletal system and the muscles that they have that are interlinking these um, ossicles, these bony plates that are embedded in their skin, they also have what's called a water vascular system. And that water vascular system is hy a hydraulic system that allows, that also functions in uh, their movement. So they move not only with muscles, but also their, end, uh, their water vascular system. And that's something that we'll study more specifically when we study the phylum Echinodermata. And whether you have an endoskeleton like we do or an exoskeleton, uh, these hard skeletons definitely give the muscle something to contract against. And there are joints that are formed within the skeleton, uh, joints to be able to move limbs and appendages. And uh, that's what arthropoda means, is jointed foot. So they have joints in their appendages and they're able to move those joints using muscles. The only difference in the way that the muscles operate in, in a an animal with an exoskeleton and an animal with an endoskeleton is where the muscles are attached. So when it comes to an endos, or an, I'm sorry, an exoskeleton, the muscles are attached to the inside of the exoskeleton. Whereas in a, for a, an endoskeleton, like your muscles are attached to the outside of your endoskeleton. But either way, they both function the same way through what's known as an antagonistic system, where one muscle contracts the other muscle relaxes. So there are pairs of muscles. There's an extensor muscle and a, and a flexor muscle in each joint. And when the flexor muscle contracts, the, uh, um, yeah, yeah the, when the flexor muscle contracts, the extensor muscle relaxes and vice versa. When the extensor muscle contracts, the, the, the flexor muscle relaxes. So again, they pull against each other 
Um, and that's known as an antagonistic system because they're antagonistic to each other. They're pulling against each other. And I just realized I didn't take into account the other phyla. So all the other phyla that don't have an endoskeleton or an exoskeleton have a hydrostatic skeleton uh, other than periphera. So that's from Cnidaria and Tenophora, which isn't on here, so you might want to add that. So Cnidaria, Tenophora, Platyomenthes, Nematoda, Mollusca, Tardigrada, and Annelida all have hydrostatic skeletons. They have cavities, fluid-filled cavities in their body, and that fluid's under pressure, and that helps to support their body. So the, the evolutionary trend that we see is from hydrostatic skeletons to uh, endoskeletons, exoskeletons, uh, with joints that are then uh, then that, that then have muscles attached to them that uh, contract against those skeletons for movement. 